So uh, I guess I guess moving on, I think the next question I have is, um, so you you joined like a couple of masterminds, right? When you decided to go into the business space, right? I think you joined Tony Robbins Mastermind, uh, Dan Sullivan, right? So could you just maybe share like from someone who was pretty new, right? Pretty new into the entire space, like, and for you to just jump straight into uh, some of these wonderful, great masterminds, what were some of your biggest lessons and perspectives you got that really like you felt that uh, because you got those lessons, right? It really helped you to accelerate your path towards business success and your wherever you are going right now. Um, I mean, the biggest thing for joining masterminds, my biggest reason for doing it is because I wanted to be around um, smarter people, more successful people, because I mean, your standards are the yeah. expectations of your peer group. That's probably yeah. the saying that I relate to the, the most um, mm. compared to like your network is your net worth and that kind of thing. Because yeah. like, basically, I, I've been, when you're around people in a room that all want to grow, you kind of, like growing becomes a norm. You just yeah. cannot help but by doing it. Mm. Um, so, so like that's kind of why I joined that. And then when I actually joined the event, I would say the part that um, I actually had actually had the most impact to me, right, was realizing that um, there are a lot of these successful people at some point, they also start giving back to the world. They also start going into spirituality. At that point, before I joined all of these things, like I basically had very little knowledge about, about um, I had been meditating for five to seven years at that point, but I've never had these transcendental experiences. I've never had this crazy um, psychedelic journeys just mm. through meditation or even through the Amazon plants kind of thing. Um, but going through like Tony Robbins, for example, going through Brandon Bouchard or going through Dan Sullivan or going through some other masterminds that I joined, like you start meeting people that, hey, you realize that a lot of people are exploring these things and these are some of the smartest people in the world. And then you're like, okay. Um, if the kind of like Elon Musk and Bill Gates kind of like level kind of people, right? This is the kind of things that they are exploring. Then there must be some truth to that. Mm. And then you start exploring, you start diving deeper and you realize that, wow, everything is just connected. It's very hard to, when you think of systems and how systems work, like every system is kind of interlinked with another system in, in some way. And everything is kind of like relate, in, in, interrelated. It's just impossible to pull yourself out of the system. And then when I started thinking that way, then I realized that it's very important for me to care about the people around me because my systems or my world overlap so much with the people around me such that the more I, I help the people around me, whether it's people that are slightly ahead of me or much ahead of me or, or, or it, like whether it's financially or health wise or people that maybe are, are less rich than me or maybe less successful than me, they're more junior than me. Like as long as you help people who have a lot of overlaps with you, mm. it's going to be worth it for you. Um, and mm. I'm not saying doing it, do it for a selfish perspective just mm. because it's good for you, but it's just, it's just better for everyone when, when you can start kind of um, helping those around you. So that's something that I really put from going for a lot of these events. More I love. So it's very like win-win, right? Everybody supports one another. So I think a lot of people uh, that, that I talk to, right, they think that, hey, when I join a mastermind, it's because I get closer to Tony Robbins, right? I get closer to Brandon Bouchard, for example. But really the value, right, then is in the network, right? Because then it really brings you up and uh, to a whole new uh, whole new stage, right? I think it's also something that you mentioned about uh, sustainable environment, right, in your book over there, which I really, I really mm -hmm. loved as well. Yeah, so yeah, so I think thank, thanks for sharing that. I think those are some huge, uh, I'm sure like that really helped to accelerate your, your journey as well, right? Any, any, any uh, plans to set up one of your own uh, in the coming uh, future? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, actually, me and my friend Nick Howard, who I'm going to start a podcast with, we're probably going to mm. start a mastermind. Um, we, are, we are already launching some like 100k plus um, one on one mm. advisory kind of, of work with some people, specifically people that, um, are living poker because there are a lot of people that have made money in poker but want to leave poker and there are also a lot of business owners that are slightly interested in poker so it's a bit of an overlap between yeah. um, poker and business kind of thing um, I'm not sure if we're going to open it up to general people yeah. um, or I'm not sure if I'm going to run my own mastermind one of the things mm. is that I'm, I'm just in the process of getting a I'm, I'm renting a, a really sick penthouse that's 6,000 square feet and mm. um, it's oh. not that expensive because of the mm. current market condition. And it's yep. like right in the middle of CBD, it's super nice, it's own jacuzzi. And I was considering like maybe like running a, a, a small private mastermind starting with a 
few closer friends and kind of seeing how that goes. So I've been thinking about it because I've joined so many and I love it. I love how much I learn when I go into it. And I love how much the group learns when I go into it. Um, but I, I wouldn't want to do it the same way that Tony Robbins or Brandon Bouchard and stuff like, like, like and, and, and do that kind of mastermind because I think the us is yeah. way too big. Um, mm. There's a few hundred there. It's like, like, yeah, yeah, a few hundred people. It ends up being like you go there and it's like a seminar kind of thing and you just get a front row seat in the seminar and then you get to sit with other people that are paying the same amount in the front row seat. And then you're always kind of torn between, okay, do I be here and talk to these other people that I really want to talk to or do I kind of focus on the lessons that are being taught? So it becomes a, a bit of a pool um, in many different directions. And generally, I mean, you pay so much, you would think that most people are, are going to be pretty, pretty successful. But there are people that actually put a platinum partnership on their credit cards and, 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 wow. and go there as well. So it's kind of yeah. like you still have to um, be careful mm. not to get scammed in the community. It's not like all just like unicorns and flowers or anything. It's like, yeah. yeah. So yeah, be a bit more discerning, right? And to be kind of like you know, like like just be wary and like just really get to know the people before you collaborate with or of sorts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So generally, I think a smaller group setting is probably the best. Like anything less mm. than twenty, I think is still fine. Where you can actually have mm. a conversation about your specific business. You can do hot seats. You can do like SWOT analysis. Mm. I really like that kind of thing where people are really helping each other's businesses and then implementing and then kind of taking action on it and then growing. I'm sure you do some of that with your friends, like like kind of mini masterminds, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So like, uh, I think I agree with you, which is saying that like really the people, right? So the, instead of just getting anyone, right? Usually when we get the people in, right? Usually everybody must like, okay, we know this person, what it does, right? And then we get instead of like just anybody, right? Who can like just um, pay, pay, pay their way in, right? So, so I love what you shared, like you want to be a bit like more selecting, so just like a mess session right yeah probably it's good for our business i know, I know some of the fans are usually to charity and all but uh, i think i get what it means the concern right is that sometimes uh, you don't know who you're talking to as well yeah and it's the when it's a big group setting then um usually like you know the saying that a single third kills the punch pool or something like that <laughs> um, yeah so there's there's sometimes in a in a setting if there's 100 people but there's like one or two idiots then now everybody's trying to avoid the idiots and then the dynamic completely changes. Wow. Nobody wants to share their secrets anymore. Um, wow. It's just, yeah. It happens. <laughs> Understood, great. So, uh, yeah, so I think moving moving on from um, the topic of mastermind, I think, I think it's great. I think uh, you have to learn so much and uh, like really I've seen like how your business has like pivoted like in the so far manner right, compared to a lot of other business owners I see and right now you're doing something that you really enjoy, right? So I really uh, like love it, right? For, for that. So I think moving on, I think I want to talk a bit more about the investing space, right? I think uh, you have invested uh, yourself before right now you're investing in like uh, middle like medium businesses right so what do you think are some of the biggest um mistakes right that investors tend to do right that you actually observe quite uh that's actually quite common among like investors out there right now right? and how do how what what will you do to kind of like overcome it right some of these potential challenges mm. that people have i mean if you're talking about retail investors i would say the first biggest mistake is that people pay too much fees um they pay like they buy like unit trusts or mutual funds and then they're not aware that if you buy through a bank or you buy through an insurance broker Sometimes you have to pay like two, three, four layers of fees and um, they give you a promise, like they tell you that this fund on average is doing 20% per annum, but then you're not aware that they, that there's survivorship bias and there's actually a thousand different funds like that and they're only showing you the one that has been doing well in the last three to five years. It really doesn't mean anything if the fund is doing well in the last three to five years if you're paying a whole bunch of fees kind of stacked on top of each other. So, I agree. Yeah, yeah that's, that's probably the biggest kind of the, the, the thing that I, I detest the most because um, I think kind of a lot of people are exploiting uh, individuals that don't know well enough. Um, if you're talking about people that, that I guess, I, I'm not super sure what kind of um, investments that, that you guys teach. Like you're still with Rash and, and stuff, right? Uh, yeah, still uh, work together, right? Uh, we still collaborate. So uh, mostly stocks and options, right? So uh, it's, a mid, uh, it's a mid between like mid-term to long-term okay. kind of investing. So, um, for options, I'm not super familiar with, um, with, with it. I've read a couple of books a long time ago. I've not actually dabbled in options myself. So I'm not going to, I'm just going to choose not to comment on that. Um, um, for, for stocks, right? I, I guess 
the common thing that you see a lot is people wanting to ask for stock tips and just kind of following people and then not really knowing why that person is getting in. And then it's like you meet a random person who's really smart and you ask him, okay, what's in his portfolio? And then he tell you that, okay, he really likes Tesla, for example. And then now you go and buy Tesla. But if you don't really know why he got into Tesla and what variables might change along the way and when to exit and when to sell the stock and stuff like that, like it might not actually do you very good to just kind of follow. And, and, and usually people that are more sophisticated, they have uh, certain asset allocation strategies. They're not going to risk certain percentages onto a certain stock. But then, um, yeah, you, if you do it yourself, you, you wouldn't know any of these things. You just buy it and then, and then what? Uh, um, just hope and pray. Um, I, I generally don't, don't really like that. Then other things that I think people make is just basically being too kind of like having like shaky hands where, where when the stock goes down, then you start selling. Like if you believe the stock was good in the first place, then it goes down without much, um, without a big, huge reason. Like let's say US government changed the rules or something like that. Um, without that kind of like really, really uh, a severe thing that can really affect the markets, right? Like if the stock goes down, then you, it's, it's not a real good reason for you to sell. Like sure, they might have had a slightly bad quarter but I mean if you believe in it in the first place then then why not continue believing in it yeah a lot of people are getting a bit more um, short termish right during this entire uh, period right? so bad quarter two bad quarters and they're out right without really the change of fundamentals right so I think that's a very good uh, advice and reminder right for, for whoever might be watching out there uh, as, at the same time as well yeah mm. yeah, yeah so I guess from the mindset perspective, which I guess I have a lot more um, expertise in because of the huge swings in poker and, 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 and my, my capacity to cope with losses is definitely higher than most people. <laughs> um, so from a mindset perspective, right, I would say that what is really important is you've got to know what is within your control and what's not within your control. And when something happens that's outside of your control, right, you don't want to blame yourself for those things because when you start blaming yourself and you start kind of like, ah, oh, your energy starts going to things that you can't control. Ah, oh, why was I so unlucky that that happened? Um, why I, I just like, I should have not sold this stock. I should have bought this stock. Like you made the best decision you can. Um, and now that the decision has been made, those things are no longer in your control. The energy and attention that you put into that is not only energy and attention that you could put into something else that's productive. It's also energy and attention that is kind of uh, making your emotional state worse. It's making your happiness level lower and it's going to make you make a worse decision in future. So it's like, yeah. you're not, you're, you're not helping you're anything. Right? just kind of compounds in, in a bad way. Yeah. No, oh, I, I love, I love what you shared. Because a lot of people really focus on like, like, ah, I should have done this, I should have done that. But honestly, the thing is, hey, we can't control it. So I really love uh, love what, what, what you just shared right there. And obviously, like, your mindset is you get to, like, face a lot more bigger swings, right? So the thing is, how do you train your mind to make sure that you only focus on what you can control, right? And perhaps learning from it if there was a mistake made and, and whatnot. Mm. So yeah. one of the things that, that I tell myself a lot when I lose a lot of money, right, is that I just tell myself that, okay, at the end of the day, I'm just going to be sleeping in the same bed. Like, life is going to be the same. Like, if I have a million dollars or I have $900,000, I lost $100,000. Like, really, life isn't that much different. <laughs> like, my lifestyle is not going to change. Like, I'm not going to change my spending habits or change anything because it's, yeah, when you have a 10% difference in, in your net worth, it's not really going <laughs> to, um, yeah, you can't really justify changing many things. So, like, mm. okay, so what? You lose, um, yeah. Um, and you start learning to, to relate to it in, in, in sort of a stoic way. And, and, and wow. stoicism books was something that um, I spent a lot of time reading in the stage that I was kind of accelerating in sticks in poker just because it really helped me to, oh, to wow. look at what's real, what's true, what's yeah. in front of you. And mm. the reality is that it's just a number in your bank account that changes. Um, nothing else really changes. I mean, of course, oh. if you lose everything, then it's, it's, it's going to change. <laughs> la, but um, don't put yourself in, manage your risk of ruin. Yeah, I think I think managing risk and then having the perspective, right? Like in case you make losses and all, right? Uh, and that's how it become better. I, I think I think that's great. I, I love that. So thanks, thanks for sharing that, Wayne. All right. So I think I'm going to lead up to uh, one of my last couple of uh, questions and one of my favorite ones, right? So uh, at least in your experience, Wayne. So uh, and I think for yours to be a bit more interesting because you actually spend uh, time with like 
six digit masterminds right like like people who are of supposedly of that level so like why um, in your opinion right in your own perspective right through your observations right what do you think are some of the biggest reasons why different people right can attend the same program workshop and in your case maybe mastermind right but achieve drastically different results what are some of the traits characteristics you feel that actually define some of the more successful people or higher performance than those who are not Hmm. I'd say the number one thing for me is having self-awareness. And the reason I say that is because you really got to be aware about your skill sets, what your superpower is, what your, what your zone of genius is. And when you go for a workshop and event, right, oftentimes it's a fire hose. Like there's just going to be so many things. You cannot apply everything that you learn. And how do you choose what to apply? It's very hard to know which is the thing that's going to work for your business right now. It's really hard to know which is the best tactic or best strategy that you need to implement. But with enough self-awareness, right, you can know that which tactic or strategy that I learned from this actually um, works well for me because of my innate skill sets, because of my innate um, characteristics. And when you can find things that kind of matches your, your innate ability, right, it makes doing it and implementing it a lot easier because you enjoy doing it. So, like if you are a good marketer and you go to a, a, a business event and now there are certain marketing tips that, that you learn and you really, really like, like those, then take action on those. You don't have to learn, you don't have to try and apply the operation stuff or the stuff about acquiring businesses or, or, or um, the stuff about hiring. Like those things are good, but stay in your own lane to, to, for the most part because basically time, when you, when you spend time doing things that you're good at, you're increasing the size of your business or you're increasing the amount of revenue that you're making. And that time that you spend doing those things are worth X amount of dollars. If you start spending time on things that you're not good at, even if it's potentially low hanging fruit, right? Your time spent doing those things because you aren't going to do it well, you aren't going to enjoy it. It's worth quite little money. So you're just far better off doing what you're good at and then kind of find, finding partners or hiring people to kind of take over the certain things, things that you might not be good at. Wow, love it. I think I think that's a great point. Like a lot of people, they try to go for the next shiny object, right? But not particularly what they might be good at or what they, they might be a bit more um conditioned to, right? So like in, in your own opinion, I think in your own um like in your own words, maybe your observations, like what do you think are some of the more actionable tips that people can um take, right, to gain a lot a higher level of self awareness? People who are starting out, people who are scratched, they really have don't have much idea of what they are doing, right? Uh, what do you think are some of your tips on how they can gain maybe that level of self awareness for themselves? Mm. Wow, self-awareness is a it's a deep one. It's something that I'm I'm personally still working on a lot myself. Yeah, yeah. It seems to be an ongoing process for most of us, but like yeah, for people who are just completely starting out, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean I mean I guess the tips that, that, that me or a lot of people would recommend would probably be journaling, meditation, just kind of taking time to reflect. Just carve out one hour in your calendar sometimes or thirty minutes in your calendar if you're really starting out and have thinking time. Take out a journal. Ask yourself questions. Ask yourself, what am I good at? Ask yourself, um, in the last week, what work activity have I done that I actually enjoy doing? And you start asking yourself these questions, you start reflecting more, and then you start, like these things, you, you can't just figure everything out at one go. You kind of have to stack it one by one. You have to ask yourself things, and maybe even ask the people around you, ask people that you trust, like, Sometimes you might not be, you might not know what you're good at. You might be a fish and you don't know that you're good at swimming. It's very common. But your family or your close friends or your close workers, they, they might know. Like they might, there might be things that they come to you and ask you for help with those things because they know that you're relatively good at those things. So you can look at that. Or if you read a lot of books or, or do a lot of courses, just kind of look, look for patterns. What kind of books do you read? What, what's the theme? Um, is it more sales related books? Is it more personal development kind of books? And that kind of gives you a bit more self-awareness as well. Wow. Right. So I think a lot of like um, journaling and reflection that's going on, right? A lot of people, they're just in the, they're ongoing, like just doing, 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 but they don't really take time to think for themselves. And hey, if I thought about gaining self-awareness to ensure that what you're doing moving forward is the most effective, the, the best one for you, right? Then a, a bit of reflection and review will really help uh, in that journey. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. So with that win, I think uh, thanks for coming with interview. I think we learned a lot, right? But I think for those who are watching out there, this is actually just a very small, uh, I would say a small preview, right? Of the, the things that Wayne shares about in his book, right? I think uh, Zen and the Business Art of 
poker. I hope I shared it correctly. But would I just share a bit a bit, a bit more about like um what uh what you're doing uh like right now like um like where where can people find you right and maybe a little bit about the book and who might be um uh, the good kind of audience right to actually read read your book. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course. So what I'm up to basically buying businesses and now I'm going to launch a podcast with my friend Nick Howard. Um, and uh, the podcast topic is going to be quite similar to the book, which is generally poker concepts and how you apply that to business. Or how do you apply advanced mindset stuff, adv- apply advanced game theory stuff into business. So those are the kind of topics that we'll probably talk about. And our general objective here is to create a community of people that are living being poker or people, business owners that play a bit of poker. And we both right now are a point in our lives that we really value um, a tribe or a community that we can build together because you just go so much. It's much more sustainable when, and you can be at the cutting edge of things if you have a community, a group of people that are focused on what they're good at and they all have each other's best interests at heart. So that would, um, when the podcast is launched, the website would be beyondpoker.net. It's probably going to launch in mid-October. So I don't know if this recording will be out by then, but beyondpoker.net. Otherwise, you can find me at ugadvisory.com. Um, if you have a big enough business and you're willing to, to invest six figures, at least 100K um, in one-on-one consulting, then I'll, I'll be able to do that for you. Um, yeah, so those are the best ways to find me. Oh, sounds great. So anyway, thanks Wayne for that uh, wonderful interview. I think one of the best things I love is that, hey, like it's not like poker, yes, it's uh, like making, you make money, right? But but I love how you want to move on to business because that's when everybody benefit, benefits and that's when you give value to everyone, right? So anyway, thanks Wayne for the interview, right? Hope to see you soon and really, right, uh, thank you once again and uh, yeah, see you soon.